Hello world! Today's topic is Can Andrew Yang's position on abortion win over the conservatives? My name is Ria Nell, a horror sci-fi author. My novella, Saito Trigger, is available on the Amazon bookstore. Links below. With a wave of anti-abortion laws sweeping across America, abortion is the hot-button topic of the week that divides many Americans. First of all, let me make this clear. If anyone thinks that they can win, and I mean win the abortion debate, I think they have lost the plot. So the point is to arrive at a position where both sides can live with. So the real question is, can Andrew Yang's position on abortion win over the conservatives to vote for him? Let's begin by looking at Andrew's position on abortion. For those who are interested in the full position, links are below. Now for the TLDR version. Andrew stands by the right to privacy, abortion, and contraception. This position is derived from the unalienable right of everyone to maintain their own bodily integrity. And the federal government's role is to put a requirement on the states to provide family planning programs overseen by a board of doctors. Not, not politicians, but doctors. And in efforts to reduce abortion, the government should provide access to contraception and social support. Overall, it's a standard fare for a pro-choice position. It's good, but nothing extraordinary. And it stands on one of the unalienable rights as declared by Thomas Jefferson, liberty. But Andrew's position does not address the fundamental problem the conservatives have with this point of view. One of the most common positions the conservative has is that life begins at conception. And therefore, life of the baby is also protected by the other unalienable right, life. So here lies in the conflict. To whom should the constitution and thereby the government protect? Should the government protect the mother's right to liberty or the baby's right to life? Isn't the government supposed to protect both? And so, this is why I said in the beginning, there is no winning the debate. However, there is an argument to be made against the idea that life begins at conception. Life begins at conception is an arbitrary position to hold because it assumes that there is no life before it. It is also assuming that sperm and egg are not life or it doesn't have the potential to become life. A better position to hold is that life has already begun billions of years ago and is still going on now. And life, therefore, before and after conception is just part of the human life cycle, and all parts of our life cycle are equally precious. Also, you know, life is a process. It's beautiful but messy. So pinning exactly where it begins is belittling that everything else that comes before and after. With that said, how does this understanding changes the definition of an embryo? Is it a person or is it a clump of cells? The rational designation would be an extension of the mother, like a new growth, or an appendage for a lack of better term. An appendage! How dare you call a baby an appendage? I can hear the outrage already. It is not as outrageous as it sounds. The fetus, like any par other part of the body, is not an independent entity. However, it is dependent on the body that it is part of. We can't just transplant the embryo to any other surrogates. Thus, the embryo is inextricably part of the mother. Now, some might say that the embryo is a unique new life because it has a completely different set of DNA. But DNA doesn't make a person because the opposite is not true. Ident identical twins with the same DNA is not the same person. I think the reason that the conservative adopted the life begins at conception idea was to answer the highly debated subject post-viability abortion. 
post-viability abortion is a difficult question to address because there is no clear-cut time frame to which a fetus is viable outside of the mother. But just because there is no clear-cut answer, it doesn't mean that there isn't a solution to achieve procedural fairness. I mean, anything less would just be intellectually lazy. In my opinion, 24 weeks is a good place to start. Statistically, a 24-week preterm baby has 50% chance to mature outside of the mother's womb. However, the resource required is extraordinary. Preterm care costs about $3,000 per day per baby. And since incubating a baby consumes societal resources, the society gets to have a say. And so, therefore, we vote. And again, I can hear the outrage already. How can you vote on a human life? It's mob rule, it's murder, etc, etc. Let me put it this way. I have never voted for a pacifist president that refused to kill anyone, nor have I voted to abolish guns, prohibit violence, or abolish the police or military in any way. Voting to end lives for, for violence happens every four years, so let the person without sin cast the first stone. I'm aware that it is impossible for pro-lifers, oh, pro-lifers sounds good, and pro-choicers, alright. So I'm aware that it is impossible for pro-lifers and pro-choicers to see completely eye to eye. But at least I believe having a vote to set limit uh, on post-viability abortion would be procedurally fair to both sides. Until we have artificial womb surrogate mothers or preterm care for every conceived fetus, the fetus is inextricably part of the mother who carries it. And the law has to protect the right of the woman. And to any pro-lifers, let's put the money where your mouth is at. Let's vote on the resources that you are willing to devote to your cause. Until then, I am not willing to tread on the slippery slope that might lead to a state where the police would investigate a miscarriage as a homicide. So that's my rent. I fully support Andrew Yang's position on abortion, but I do think he needs a little woof at breaking down the conservatives' arguments to protect the rights of women. And that's all, world.